evening, everyone. Welcome to our celebration of life for our dear friend, Blake. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to remind folks we are recording and live streaming the event today. So if you wouldn't mind muting your, your cell phones, just to be sure that there's no embarrassing ringtones while we're underway. So um, thank you all for coming. We've got guests from near and far here today. And we'll, we'll recognize a few of them uh, as we go. Uh, but to start off, I'm going to introduce uh, Tony Horvatten. My name is Chris Vaughn. If, for those that might not know, this is Tony Horvatten, and we're pleased to be your MCs today. And Tony, I'll pass it to you, and you can introduce the family. Thank you, Chris. Is that sounding okay, Andrew? Work? Okay. So it's my pleasure to w also to welcome everyone here today. Um, there's been a lot of planning and, uh, underway for some time to have this event to recognize Blake's contribution and, and, as, and uh, as a family member to the Nancaro clan. But he certainly has left his mark at the Toronto Centre, so we were very happy to, uh, to offer our venue to host the celebration here. And uh, I'd like to make a special welcome to Donna Nancaro, Blake's sister, and Marie Nancaro, Blake's mom, and uh, Steve, who's also here, who's Donna's other half. So we welcome the family uh, to join us here as well. And there are many friends as well from his other walks of life uh, in motorsport and uh, computing and from school too. So welcome to you all. All right. And with that, I think what I'll do is I'll turn the microphone over to Marie, who has a few words to say. I don't know how to use these things. Good. Am I speaking to them? I just can't tell you how touched we are, our small family that's left, with um, all of how many friends Blake had. It's um, and and as they said, coming from all different aspects of life. And I think the reason I'm so surprised is because when you have a child, you've got them until they grow up. And then when they grow up, they go away to work or do whatever it is they want to do. And you don't really know what they're doing anymore. Like, who knows the things he got into that I didn't learn about until I've talked to a lot of people and looked at all of his paperwork and that sort of thing. But I'm just overwhelmed by the number of people that call him friend. And that means so much to Don and I. And... We're happy to make a donation later on to the observatory to be used in any way they want, hopefully maybe in teaching young astronomers. But thank you so much for coming. It, it really means a great deal to us. Thank you very much for that, Marie. Um, so now Donna has something she'd like to say, but she's preferred to provide it to us in a video. So um, AV team, if you're ready, if you'd like to run that video for us, we can watch it on the screen here, and it will also be provided to the live stream. Thanks. My bro. Blake was my brother, and I couldn't have asked for a better one. Although he wouldn't let me in the snow fort he'd built outside our home in Aurelia. That was 1969. I was two. This must have spurred his interest in building an igloo, which came to fruition right here at Carr Observatory. Blake was born in Peterborough and then lived in Meaford. I asked him recently what he remembered about our home in Petrolia where I was born, and he said, was there a rocket? He may have been referring to a rocket-shaped climbing bar nearby. Blake's interest in space began very early, which he has documented in detail on his blog, lumpydarkness.com. We moved from town to town when dad was transferred by the bank. Although we had to leave friends and make new ones, I always had my brother. We were very close and shared many interests, including photography, camping, the natural world, cats, baseball, potatoes, 
Gargoyles, Fireflies, Star Trek, etc. Mom had instilled in us a deep curiosity for many things. While living in Waterloo, ever curious Blake picked up a garter snake by the sharp end. I screamed as the snake bit, thinking that was the end of my bro. Blake and I were four years apart, which made for an interesting high school initiation. The grade 13s, Blake and friend Cameron, posing as farmers versus the grade nine chickens, me. He valued his friends and kept in touch with many over the years and miles. One Christmas morning, on our way to Trenton to visit the relatives, Blake, about nine years old, asked what was the rattling noise coming from the car. Dad wasn't too concerned until our tire fell off. His interest in cars began early as well and developed into a passion for advanced driving and racing his BMW. Blake organized and taught at many driving schools and made many friends that shared his interest. When our dad was battling cancer, Blake shaved his curly hair off in support. My brother followed his passions and was all in, learning everything he could about them. He had such a desire to share his knowledge with others. Like our mom, Blake was a true teacher of computers, advanced driving, and astronomy. He loved to learn and loved to teach. He showed us Jupiter, Saturn, and solar flares exploding from the sun. I miss him terribly, but I know his beautiful soul is not far away. Thank you to everyone for sharing in this celebration of life. Donna. this point, I will turn the mic back to Chris, who will read some um, notes or letters that were sent to us from people who knew Blake, felt strongly about him, but just couldn't be here today, but felt compelled that they wanted to share some thoughts. So, Chris. Thanks, Tony. Uh, before, I, before I read the messages, I also remark that during your free time this afternoon, please take advantage of the various telescopes that we're, that we have set up looking at the sun. We have a table of Blake's um, memories over near the um, uh, beyond the GBO over there. And inside in the um, in the living room, we've got a slideshow running of some tributes that were posted about Blake and for Blake on the RAS forum. And there's actually a uh, I believe there's a word doc open that allows you to type in your own uh, to add your own content. And we'll we'll put all that material together and repost it publicly on the forum to add to the uh, the legacy that's already there. So please take advantage of all that. So we do have some people that could make it today, and I'll just share uh, share their thoughts, and then invite uh, anyone else that wants to come up to the mic for microphone and share some thoughts as well. So this is Joanne Salsi, who's a national member of RASC. She says, "Hello, I won't be able to attend the event this weekend in honor of Blake." I do want his family to know, though, the impact he has made on people in the RASC and beyond without him ever meeting them. I participated in many online Stellarium courses and learned everything I know from Blake. He was so generous with sharing his knowledge and skills. Every time I use Stellarium, I can hear his instructions in my head. I use Stellarium in public education and outreach, so Blake's reach is far. Blake also provided the opportunity for a free Stellarium app through his column in the RASC Journal, and I was the lucky winner of that, of that app. So thank you, Blake. Your impact is far-reaching, greatly appreciated, and will always be remembered. Sincerely, Joanne. Louisa Gamboro writes, I recall Blake with fondness from decades ago. We both shared a love of cars and driving. We lost touch, 
Please convey my condolences to the family. I can't attend today. Adventures with Blake from Diane Dale. It's hard not to call every time you hung out with Blake on an adventure, as everyone who knows him knows he always made everything awesome. I think I first met Blake in the early 2000s. I was attending performance driving schools. One of my favorite series to attend was the Saab driving schools. The cast of characters was amazing, and of course Blake, who made these events incredible, was always in top form. Not only was he a master at organizing things, he created systems and processes for those driving schools that made everything super efficient. If you know, you know how much energy and effort he put into that. He really cared about everyone and, his exper and the experience they were having. He created learning manuals, track maps, instructions to rival any big organizers. If you were at Blake's events, you got the best experience. But mostly, Blake made it fun. He had a wicked sense of humor and made everything in life fun. Over the years, we shared so many great experiences. I felt so fortunate to have him as a friend in this life. He was the best IT geekster. We both worked in IT, so we shared code, prehistoric hardware collections, a few floppy drives of obscene and unusual macros and programs, and of course, dry humor jokes that only IT folks get. He was a beloved car dude and an awesome driver. We both loved tracking old cars, him in his BMW, me in my Datsun. Who else in the world besides Blake would know exactly how many laps he'd done? On which tracks and over how many years? And everyone knew where to find him at the track. Helmet perched on top of his head. It never got tired. It was his signature style. He was a master gadget bringing his CB radio on road trips so we could listen in on the truckers going by. Camping gadgets which made setup, cooking, and cleaning the easiest ever. Giving, gifting me a space pen when writing our lap times in the rain on paper was harder than it needed to be. Traveling with his weather radar machine so we knew exactly what we were in for and how to manage it all. He was a master fix-it, helping me so, so many times with track dog, street dog, and Clifford the big red truck and trailer. He even helped me to run tech sessions for women only at the Saab schools, making the events fun scavenger hunts and making the women feel more welcome than ever at the track. He fixed up radios, batteries, communications, you name it. If it was electronic, he could bring it back to life and make good use of it. He was the best crew chief anyone could ask for. So precise and detailed that twice I ran out of fuel on the cool down lap. Of course he had calculated the exact amount required to finish the race and keep the car light. Right to the checkered flag and only a few corners more. And maybe he was a little too amused that it resulted in someone having to tow the little Datsun back to the paddock. And Blake was such a willing participant in everything. Let's build a go-kart-like contraption so my nephews can compete in the lawn chair races at Varak Shure. Let's try the Mentos and Diet Coke experiment. A couple of times, sure. Let's go to a water park and try the biggest slides over and over again until we're exhausted, sure. Let's play the video, I was seventh, over and over again until we can't breathe through the laughter anymore. But of course. My brother and his family were also devastated to hear that the world had lost Blake. Because, of course, Blake showed up in person to teach my nephews about the solar system with a legitimate scale demo in the neighborhood of how big the planets were and how far apart they were, of course. Blake knew the next closest solar system was Kingston based on their model. It blew their minds and they still talk about that experience to this day. One of my nephews is finishing his PhD in quantum physics and I like to think that Blake had a little something to do with that. I could go on, but these were the stories that I thought I could share that might trigger thoughts of Blake's and Blake and others as well. Blake had a unique perspective on the world. He saw and experienced things like none of us did, and he shared it with us. We we're all so much better off to have him in our lives. I hope that he knows that. I hope I'm sorry that I never got a chance to tell him how much he meant to me, how much he impacted my life, and how much he meant to all of us. I wish I could have comforted him in his final adventures with us here. I wish I'd been able to say goodbye, no matter how impossible that would have been. I do hope that Blake is in a blissful place in the universe that we haven't all discovered yet, that he lives amongst the stars that he loved and admired so much, and he's able to hear and feel us speak about how much he was treasured. Blake, you'll always hold a special place in our hearts. 
I continue to think of you often, and I look forward to seeing, seeking out your perspective on the most common and uncommon things that we find in our lives. Until we see you again, dear friend. And last up, one, a message from Scott Hall. A big part of my experiences with Blake all involved driving and racing. I met Blake through another track buddy in the 90s, and for years we were driving and instructing with BMW and Canada and the US about 25 days a year. Lots of laughs, adventure, and shared experiences. Blake was an accomplished advanced driver, instructor, and racer, and was the chief instructor for the Saab Club of Canada's driving schools. He took a group with fa failing interest and enrollment, and within two years, had a constant stream of full sold-out events, contributing greatly to the club. When I was racing and needed a new crew chief for the weekend, Blake was it. I completely trusted him, and, and he knew all of the details needed to make the weekend run smoothly, with a laugh. His students raved about him as he was a natural coach. He was happy to help anyone gain knowledge on skills he was passionate about, software technology, astronomy, and advanced driving. He was a regular at our High Park poker games and always brought something interesting to sip on and lots of laughs. He was a good friend, and I'm going to miss him. And those are the messages. Thanks. So I think we can open the floor up to folks that might want to come and share. Just step up to the podium and, uh, and, and uh, share some of your feelings. Come on, Jeff. Thanks very, much. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, Blake, some of you already know, has had, uh, has, there, that tells you something else. Blake had a very unique sense of humor. Um, he found out I was crazy about a little cat. And one day he came up with a special gift, this t-shirt. It has a space cat on it. And I only wore this space cat t-shirt here at the, at the car. And I'm happy to show it to you now because every time I wear it, I think of Blake and it makes me smile. And Marie and Donna, I hope it makes all of you smile. Thank you very much. Come on up, Phil. The hat collection is. Well, Blake and I have much more in common than just astronomy and the CAO. Um, Blake was a very well-rounded guy. He did a lot of things, and many things he would do he may have never tried before, but he would always say yes. He would always say yes to everything. Hey, you want to do something? Yeah, let's do that. So Blake and I have actually done, back in the day, it was called the Ride for Heart, which is this weekend, actually, uh, up and down the DVP in the Gardener. He and I did that together a few times. We've cycled around the CAO. We did the Beaver Valley. And he gave me this T-shirt <laughs> as well, too, because we were biking buddies as well as astronomy buddies. But I think one of the things about Blake was if you needed help, he's the guy to go to. He never says no. We're going to miss him. Oh, we're just we're just collecting them. We're just collecting them. Um, I'll talk about my shirt too. So I I uh, I'm wearing this shirt as a tribute to Blake because in 2017, a number of the rascals went down to Glendo, Wyoming, to watch the solar total solar eclipse. My first ever. I think it was his first ever too. I won't say what he said, Grace, but if you want to share that privately with people later, you can. But a number of us are here from that day, and um, that's a favorite memory. Yeah bunch of us. All right, come on up. Um, my name is Ed, and I do know Blake very much through the RAS scene. I may be able to make some reminiscences, but I'm actually wearing a different hat, and I'm glad it was mentioned before. I am the current president of the Saab Club of Canada. Now, Blake's activities in the club predated my ownership of a Saab, so the and he never actually mentioned it to me, even though he knew I owned a Saab. So the first time I found out that of his activities was looking through some old newsletters and 
Blake Nancaro. How many Blake Nancaros could there be? It's probably the one because I I'd had rides in his BMW up to the CAO, so I knew exactly how passionate he was about driving. So what we did recently, because I personally had no experience with the club, we had a meeting where we called up like the older members and we had some reminiscences. Um, so just talking about the driving school from an organizational point of view, it's a ma it was a massive project. There's like thousands of dollars of exposure because we had to rent a track. We had to make sure we had enough participants at a few hundred dollars a piece and it had to be organized. And anyone who's tried to put on an event like that knows it is not easy. It takes dedication, it takes skill, and it certainly takes a lot of time and effort. And Blake made those schools successful. We, we did not lose money. We had lots of people there. He started something called the No Testosterone Driving School for those who didn't want to participate with like young guys with really loud modified cars, I guess. Um, and, and he actually brought his mother in there too. His mother helped out in, in some of the events in like, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to catch up like how that worked because like I say, I wasn't there in person. I wouldn't let you get in the car until I had seen your insurance. <laughs> oh, that's, that is perfect. We need something like that. Um, we still have the, um, he instructed our instructors and checked them out. And we still do have actually a copy of his um, performance driving manual, which we will review and we've posted for our members and certainly we will not forget that. So the Saab Club remembers Blake's contributions and we're really appreciated of them. Thank you. And I also say he gave me a ride around Mosport track in that BMW. It the hell out of <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Stuart, or, or Stu, as Blake used to call me all the time, an old friend back from the 80s and 90s and in present day. Um, in fact, I think for the astronomer crowd, one day I got a call from Blake in the late 80s and he said, Stu, can you come over? I need your, your Jeep for a second. So drove over to his apartment and he said, we're picking up a telescope. It was his first telescope and we drove over to Edmund Scientific and I thought like a telescope, it'd be like a little thing we're going to throw in the back seat. And it was like putting Tetris in the Jeep. It was like these massive crates that all, all together we got in. But anyhow, the one thing I think about when I think about Blake, he got me back into cycling and he had this beautiful red Mealy bike. And this again is the late eighties. And so we did a lot of cycling together through Toronto. And one day I was going along Young Street and I hit a sewer grate in my bike and I went end over end on the bike and folded my front tire into a taco. And I couldn't believe it. I was by myself. And I, when I got home, I called Blake and I said, you're not going to believe what happened. I hit this sewer grate. And he goes, that sewer grate, that's the one on Young Street, two blocks south of St. Clair. <laughs> and I went, yeah, how did you know that? And he said, it's the only one left in Toronto that they haven't crisscrossed yet. You hit that grate. And he was so geeked out and excited about that grate that I could hit it of all the odds in the universe, you know? And so I was like, yeah, I'm okay, you know, by the way, Blake. So, um, but, you know, really what hits, and we were, my wife and I, Laurie, were talking about on the way up. Like all through the 2000s and 2010s when we had kids, and we had camping trips with all our old friends and families. Blake would be the one who'd bring out his telescope and he invigorated and brought interest to a lot of kids amongst our friends. And I know my two boys, super into astronomy now because of Blake. So what he gave back to our friends and our kids was amazing. So I love him for that and I'm going to miss him. Red Mealy. Mealy was the brand. Yeah, it was a road bike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a beautiful bike. For the in the nineties, it was amazing. So. <laughs> Come on up. Thanks, I'll sort of go go off the seat of my pants here. So I'm Cam or Cameron. Uh, I would have met Blake in September of '79 or '80. I'm not sure when he when you when he moved to St. Thomas. Is that grade ten or grade eleven? 79? 79, so Jim says 79. So a couple of quick anecdotes around that. Yes, we were, you were the chickens and we were the farmers. That's, you know, as tradition uh, would have it. <clears throat> but a couple of things I wanted to bring uh, to mention that what I hear interesting about this is these Venn diagrams of people that Blake knows. And sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. 
Um, and if it weren't for Blake, I would not have met Jim James Jetboy. <laughs> um, that's one person, by the way. Uh, Malcolm, and would not have met Stuart and Laurie, who are here, um, who we met at one of Blake's infamous parties up on Yonge Street, not that far north of the sewer grate. <clears throat> um, and my comment there is that our lives, my wife and my Hillary uh, lives, are certainly richer for the people we've met through Blake. So he made those connections, and I think he's made our, all of our lives better. And we really do thank him for that. The other anecdote, and Tony was talking about it earlier, is we all got invited to a party somewhere, a pub somewhere, I can't remember where it was. A bunch of us were there, and we weren't quite sure why we were going there until we arrived and realized that it was it was not a birthday, but it was ex either 20 or 30,000 days he'd been alive. So I, so he didn't want birthdays, but he wanted you know to mark 5,000, 10,000, et cetera, days. So I leave it somebody in the room to go into Excel sometime, put in his birth date and his death date, and somebody needs to recognize how many days he was alive, because I'm sure that probably would be more important to him than the number of years. That's how many times he went around the sun. So anyway, to going around the sun as many times as we can. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. I'm Jim James Jetboy. <laughs> Thomas James, a man with two first names. I met Blake uh, <clears throat> the summer we were 15, just a couple of months uh, before school that year, Cam, so it was 79. And you had a house uh, in St. Thomas, a split level. And Blake had the bright idea of, you know that bottom spot in the split level where you put the Christmas decorations and forget about everything? Well, he decided part of that was going to be his bedroom. And he, oh yeah. That that high. Yeah, it's shorter than him. <laughs> yeah. And he had the walls painted black and he had the lights. Uh, he had uh, uh, made a model of the Enterprise, as had I. But what he had done is wired up LED lights uh, inside it and whatnot and had all that. He uh, did that with uh, a Frisbee so that when you held it, it had the red light on the top that was working. And he rigged up a centrifugal switch so when you threw it, the green lights opened, <laughs> turned on on the outside, you know. Uh, it, it, just always tinkering with things like that. Uh, he had a, a turntable that had a, a belt drive that he could flip it over. So we sat down there and played Pink Floyd backwards. <laughs> yeah, he did a little soundproofing in that room, too. Yeah, yeah. Five years or four years later, he and I are going to Waterloo. And in the summer of 83, we were on a, a school term on campus. Uh, I don't know how the hell he did it, but he got the room 007. I had to take 008. <laughs> but in the dorm uh, uh, building on Waterloo, uh, so that was essentially the basement. But when you crank open the windows, the ground was right there. And it was sunny side. And so he had his speakers. We'd throw them out onto the lawn and we'd go out there with our books and sunglasses and we'd sit and listen to music and, and study out in the lawn. It was just wonderful. And uh, one uh, uh, week um, just across the lawn was a big ballpark where um parachute club played <laughs> and he danced barefoot in the grass until his feet bled <laughs> and one thing we came up during that term and uh, i know uh some of our friends like Stu, uh, uh we talked talked about this later um uh, blake was a an unreservedly expressive individual including with his dancing we called it blake dancing and, and it was just so infectious and fun um, yes, he was into cars, small cars. I remember when he came over, we were living on Fairview, and he brought over the 76 Honda Civic you had, pulled into my driveway. And I said, hey, that's great. Throw me the keys. He threw me the keys. I went around the front lawn. I'd never seen a car that small. Uh, and um, he ran that car into the dirt. Uh, <laughs> oh, you, you, you took it and finished it? Okay. <laughs> One of the things that uh, Blake and I shared, and I don't have many people to share this with, is uh, a deep love for science fiction writing. Uh, he introduced me to authors like Delaney, and uh, there was a passion that we did share uh, for the years, and I just love that because it's different than movies. No, but now I want to read it. <laughs> 
McKinsey, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and, um, but another thing that we shared is a uh, love of horror movies. Uh, you know, he'd, uh, when he was down on Liberty, he'd say, uh, call me up, Jim, you want to go uh, rent a movie? Sure. One year he pulled out uh, Fearless Vampire Killers, odd stuff like that. And um, um, he uh, would go to a place on Bathurst called After Dark Video that had all these oddball things. Some of you people nod, some of you know it. So he was able to, uh, had interests, multiple interests, but he pursued those interests. He'd go down that, what we call now a rabbit hole, and he'd find, well, what place does have those kinds of things that I want, Edmund Science or, or After Dark Video. Uh, so he didn't just have these, you know, wild interests. He actually pursued them, which I, I really appreciated. Um, Talk about uh, uh, the uh, place on uh, Young was the time when he really loved to host friends over. I had a two-story um, apartment up there, and I can remember on New Year's Eve there, we were just, first, we all stood around watching uh, Winnie the Pooh, because <laughs> it was hilarious when Rabbit got caught in a hole. And then on with the music, probably out of the same turntable, uh, and just a wonderful, gracious, uh, generous host of those things. Um, a few years ago, I uh, was interested in starting up with vinyl again, and uh, I asked him, and I've got that turntable now. <laughs> Why something like that would choke you up, but it matters to me. I have that turntable. I, I don't want the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thanks for listening. I wanted to share some of those stories because I've known him a long, long time since, I, like I say, we were 15 years old. He's the oldest male friend I've had. I miss him terribly. I miss my science geek buddy and my horror buddy. And um, let's all just keep loving him. I can't be the only RAST member here that doesn't wish they were at a party where Blake was dancing. I, I missed that part. Risa, come on up. Hi, everyone. Uh, I don't know Blake. I didn't know Blake as long as many of you did. He was one of the first people I met here after Phil and Laura, having driven 3,000 kilometers across the country and, like, jumping out of my car and unpacking my scope. And he, along with many of you here, taught me so much about astronomy. Um, I have really amazing memories. I could not find the video of him th throwing the biggest bubbles right here on Starbecue. And living out in Saskatchewan, I have felt very distanced um, this year since his passing, and so I'm very glad uh, to have been invited today. There are little tiny things I remember about Blake, but every day when I drive, I check my mirrors, and Blake taught me how to set my mirrors. And every time I pull through or back in, <laughs> I think about Blake. And every time I hold the wheel with two hands, I think of Blake. So I really miss him. Uh, on September 24th, 2023, I calculated 21,915 days. I'll just, um, you know, as a contemporary about the same age and experience level Blake as an astronomer you know he wasn't as much a teacher to me as a as a but he still mentored me you know he made me a better astronomer now when I first decided that I could do the RASC observing programs my first one was the Messier and I remember I was done and who am I going to get to review it and I'm going to give it to Blake and I knew because Blake was going to review it that it had to be every I dotted and T crossed and he made me a better observer and I thank him for that Tom. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Luton, president of the Toronto Center. Um, put it simply, Blake was a genius. And the reason I know this is because it was impossible to get him to join the executive. Um, clearly, he knew more than I did. <laughs> Um, 
I'm doing this a little freehand at the moment. Uh, Blake used to love reviewing things uh, to the point that I would sometimes use the joke from Top Gear that we were now turning things over to our tame racing car driver. Um, and he had this habit of always showing off some new piece of equipment out of his car trunk after a meeting, which, again, uh, to which I just started getting to the point, especially when this was done in the garage uh, of the pub where we go after the meetings, um, looking a little suspicious. The point that I, again, I coined the term blaking bad for when he'd have one of these see what I've got sessions. Um, it, uh, there's a poem that we astronomers use a lot when a member has passed. Um, it's called The Old Astronomer to His Pupil. Uh, it's too lengthy to read here. The, it goes on for several stanzas, but there's a line in here that I just want to quickly read out. Um, yeah. Um, Though my soul may set in darkness, it will rise in perfect light, for I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. That's for you, Blake. Hi, my name is Thomas. I too didn't know Blake very long, only from the CAO. You're right, Blake loved nature. But did you know nature loved him too? These tables we built as a team and Blake was a ringleader. He set us a task, got us to do things, and we all doing our things, and out of the blue come a swarm of bumblebees and chased Blake. We don't know why. He had to retreat into the building. Nature loved him. The other day, he was working in the shed, and out comes a nice big long snake. That is when he told us about picking up a snake by the tail. What he said was, Everything was okay, he was cool, till you started crying, Blake is going to die. And he said, that's what I thought I'm going to die. I was okay till then. Blake lives in every, practically every piece of this building, from the benches, to the insides, to the wiring, to the electrical, he lives. It'll be a shame to let his memory fade. And to that end, Marie, I will join you in making a contribution and ask the committee that they use it to, for something to remember Blake by in the long run. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. And be nice to the bees as well. Um, I'm not sure if I remember that anecdote in particular. I remember one time many years ago, we visited the CAO and we found leafcutter bees. Once again, inside one of these, um, maybe not this generation of picnic table, maybe the previous generation because it was wearing out. Um, but uh, I, I, now, I guess starting now, I'm gonna think about Blake every time I think about uh, my bees. Um, but I wa also wanted to thank Blake one more time, uh, belatedly, for all of his writing. Um, his writing about this place, uh, because he didn't just write uh, a column in our local newsletter, and he didn't just write a column in the Journal of the RASC nationally uh, for many years, um, but he also um, wrote the annual reports for places like the CAO. Unless, correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, it sounded like that it came from his pen uh, rather than yours, but he wrote down everything that happened at the CAO for those annual reports. So um, don't omit any details when you get the chance to write these things down. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katrina. Um, I just want to tell a really short story about two Dobsonians, Blake Nanko and the CAO. So I had a tracking Dobsonian. It was a sky watcher. I didn't 
have it for that long. But in the time I had it, it was one of those ones that normally daubs, you put them on the ground and you just push them at what you want to look at. Great. This is one of those sort of fancier tracking ones. And so anyway, Blake saw this thing. He's like, how's it working for you? I'm like, all right. He's like, and one, there were a couple of times I was doing it and it didn't quite work. He's like, oh, and you know, Blake, Blake was like into tinkering. With stuff, right? So we voided the warranty on the spot. He takes the telescope, puts it on the table, takes the casing off the thing and starts fixing and he Blakeified it, made it better. Right. And then if, I never had any problems after that. And then um, Jeff Garrity, unfortunately, another member who passed away a few years ago, he had a, an 11 inch Dobsonian and Blake is, he had this persistent uh, sort of way about him. And he's like, you have to get Jeff's scope. I'm like, I don't need another tell. You need to get this scope. Anyway, guess who has Jeff's scope? <laughs> because Blake was just, and Blake bought it here. He bought it to the CAO. He's like, here's your scope. It's yours now. I'm like, oh shit. Okay, thank you. So anyway, so whenever I think of that scope, it's like, and Blake also to Thomas's point about this place and Blake, yes, I can still see him standing perilously on the edge of the garage roof <laughs> doing, I don't know what the fuck. Yeah, like, I mean, like doing something with the antenna. I was like, oh yeah, I was like doing one too many things. I'm like, Blake, you sure? He's like, no, no, it's fine. He'd be like up there. I can see him in his shorts and his big boots and like safety sandals. Um, so yeah, this place for me is about Blake and, you know, like Risa and other people who didn't really, you know, who met people here and learnt, you know, the brain trust of the people in this club. Blake is definitely part of the DNA of this place and uh, I will miss him deeply. Thank you. Blake was amazing at giving presentations, wasn't he, on anything, you know. Um, he was doing the sky this month for Rask, and then when we transitioned to online and YouTube streaming, did a number of presentations there. He's got the barn door tracker video on YouTube that everybody keeps getting offered all the time. It's the top top video for astronomy, I think, on YouTube. Jen and I had him on Insider's Guide to the Galaxy a couple of times because he had his his expert areas where you wouldn't want anybody but Blake to be on your show when you were talking about this double stars and things like that. So we got we Ed want to come up. Come up to the mic. So one of my first uh, interactions with Blake was I wanted to do better PowerPoint presentations for our, our meetings. And Blake offered to teach me like you want to use dark backgrounds and lighter font rather than light background because it's a dark room. And I had to stand him for a burger and a beer for his advice. <laughs> So I just want to wrap, finish the thought by reminding you that we've actually compiled a list of some of the streams and YouTube videos that Blake participated in. And I think if you uh, head on in the house, you can find that list and then make note of it. Yep, come on up. Hello, I'm Jerry. One of Blake's uh, downtown Toronto friends and friends from uh, University of Waterloo. Blake uh, was one of my wife and I, our first shared friend. He was always very positive and very quirky. Um, he always had a really positive attitude about things and always loved to tinker. I remember him talking about tinkering with all kinds of stuff. In fact, he was the one who got me, does anybody remember the Scions that Blake had? Blake got me into the cult of the Scion and I, I have several of those thanks to him. Um, we always talked a lot about cycling and tinkering with bikes and uh, brewing and beer and drinking a lot of beer together. That was always a lot of fun. Um, my wife and I, we held a lot of uh, parties in Toronto and Blake attended every single party we ever threw in downtown Toronto. At least two of them were in the blizzard. And I think one of them, he showed up on his bike. And there were at least, like, there was one party, I think, he was one of maybe two people that showed up. But he made sure he attended every single party that we threw. Um, but one of my best Blake stories is um, Blake realized, he gave me a call at work one day, and he was like, are you free later on today? Or, like, next tomorrow or a couple days? Because he said, I just realized I'm 10,000 days old. It ends up being around 27, 4 months, and 25 days. And it was a big deal. Um, we met up at Fiddler's Dell, 
and uh, we drank a lot of beer, of course, and talked about a lot of quirky calendar stuff and more uh, astronomy stuff. And, uh, you know, I still think about them every day because my wife and I, we drive by places and we're like, Blake would, we went there with, and so, you know, we still shed a tear every now and then. Thank God for Blake. Anyone else? Last call. Tony or Grace, did you want to say anything? Oh, is it coming up? I think we've got one more. I was a computer trainer for many years and still get nervous getting up in front of people. Uh, I met Blake through the Computer Trainer Network in Toronto. Um, B, do you remember when that year that was? Early 90s. Um, and he was never Blake to me. He was blah. And I was Ma. And so there are still people that call me Ma, even though uh, not too many people. Um, Scott Hall, who you read out earlier, just still calls me Ma all the time. And it, uh, I always think of Blake for that. Um, I also had uh, thoughts of the Scion. And um, it's funny that a bunch of people had T-shirts on because one of the things that Blake and I did for many years back and forth was we had this great idea that we were going to start a T-shirt company with clever T-shirt uh, sayings on it. So I'd be getting e emails from him and it would just be t-shirt idea. And then it would just be the one line of what he wanted to put on the t-shirt. And I would send him one back that I would had thought of. And I thought one day we would just compile this, you know, multitude of emails that would uh, have that. I think we can all relate to uh, Blake's emails. They were uh, often quite quirky. You had to read them about two or three times before you really got all the different nuances on them. But I used to love them. I, um, always got an email uh, from him um, on the changing of the tires, uh, and you would uh, he would teach he would remind me how to drive on uh, on um, uh, you know on uh, winter tires, and then he, I would get another email from him to remind me how to drive on summer tires. Um, I received an email from from Donna uh, where she sent me this little meme, and it was about uh, it was a celebration of uh, people who don't believe in winter tires, and it was just this big crash. And uh, she said, I, I didn't know who to send it to, so I knew you would like it. Um, always got uh, an email on Pi Day, you know. Uh, always got one on my on my birthday, uh, always a, a bit quirky. Um, I would always send him a, an email on solstice. And, um, uh, and on winter solstice, he would send an email back and just say, I hate this day. And then he would just go in about why he hated winter solstice, but he loved the winter, the summer solstice. So it was always something that we would send back and forth on. Um, I did that. I went down a bit of a rabbit hole uh, a little while back and read out a whole bunch of my old emails from him. And it brought back amazing memories because you do forget. We, as we get older, we do forget about stuff. But I don't think I'll ever forget blah and all the different bits on it. I loved his inventions. Uh, one day in my house, I, I or I used to leave the garage door open by mistake, or there would be something in it, and it would be flashing on and flashing off the whole for you know for for twelve hours till I walked out the next day, and my neighbors would laugh at me about that and things. And he thought, well, we'll rig up this little thing so that there was a, a red light um, in the uh, in the um, just above the front door that was on if the door was open, so that I could just look down the hallway real quick and knew it was open still. And uh, and um, but it was always that idea that he was always looking to uh, recycle instead of throwing something out. He was always looking to find creative ways to do things, um, always finding cool things to do with a computer. We had this love of being able to share uh, t t uh, tips and tricks on um, on uh, computers. He would be so excited to be able to show you a new way to do something. Uh, and it really was something that it was lovely to share with. So one day I'll make a t-shirt company and I'll sell one to all of you. <laughs> oh, and uh, oh, yeah, for free. Um, I, unlike uh, Jet, uh, sorry, Jet Boy, Jet James, whatever. And um, uh, um, I went down, I finally got to meet Marie. I think we met one other time, but this one, I went down to Mar Marie and she had said to me, J she kept saying Jim, Jim Thomas. And I was like, who's this Jim Thomas guy? Uh, or Donna as well, and 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 it was like I know him as Jet, and um, I don't know him as James or Jim or any other or Jet Boy. It's just always been Jet to me. Um, and then also, you know, it was kind of funny with 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 uh, with Blah. Um, definitely the beer and the uh, the single malt scotches, uh, and uh, probably way too many of those. Um, making beer in my in my uh, 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 kitchen, 
Um, and then also um, I was not, you know, the horror stories. I was the, the quirky TV shows like, uh, like corner gas um, corner gas would come on and we would, we'd talk endlessly about all the different fun things about them. So anyway, I'm going to miss law and uh, I do think of him often as well. And uh, I'm sure as everyone does, we just need to keep those memories alive. Sounds like Blake should have had a podcast. I think he came. I think, yeah. All right. So without you know, without any further comments, what will happen next is that Tony's going to get ready to do some rocket launches for us. You want to do some comments first? All right. Yeah, sure. Take it away. Well, a, a few things I heard today sort of twig some memories as well, and, and just to speak to a few points, and uh, in, in no particular order, I guess, as well. That that 20,000-day uh, birthday party, uh, Grace and I were invited to that as well, too, but it was very clandestine, kind of very mysterious. He just called us up and he said, hey, I got something to celebrate and announce. Will you guys come down to the pub with me, you know? And we said, sure. We thought, you know, we, we didn't we didn't really know what it was about. And when we got there, uh, I think Malcolm and Cam, you were there, too, that the same in the, in the pub. And he announced that yes, it was. We we thought it was twenty thousand days. We figured it out right, but he was very digital, and and uh, what struck that home to me was he had a wristwatch that read the time only in digital language, in sorry binary language. That means ones and zeros. Okay, no clock face, no numerals, ones and zeros. So he'd look at it. And he'd have to calculate what the time is. On that now that's a geekster that's about as geeky as, as you get and and he showed that to me i thought i just shook my head i said like <laughs> okay now okay the shannonville shannonville motorsport park okay so blake bought me a gift one year probably around 2010 i think and um he was as, as we know multifaceted but the, the motorsport was a big part of his life and he loved his 88 bmw m3 and I think it's still it's still cowering around somewhere, but and he, he it hasn't been on the road for some time. I know that, but he loved that machine and had the, the the racing numbers on it, the whole deal, and it was road road ready. I even drove it once on the on the four hundred. Yeah, um, and and uh, I think my son drove it too. But anyway, uh, so he bought me this uh, present to to come to Shannonville, and do a uh, uh, a track instruction in my car. Well, being a family man with three kids, uh, my car was a Mazda MPV van, Min <laughs> minivan. So Blake, so that doesn't matter, you know, just like in computer software, you run what you brung, you know? So yes, he made me completely empty my car of everything that was not factory provided. If it was not screwed down, whatever, jettison out, had to be completely sterile. There, nothing could move in there. And yeah, with my regular street tires and whatever else, I got paired with an ins instructor. We put our helmets on and we hit the track. And oh my God, you know, they said, get on it, get on it, get on it, get on it. And then you get to the, br the corner and you got a break. How we did not barrel roll that car, I have no idea. No idea. I was just, there were so many times where you got that close to the edge of the track. I thought, that's it. We're over. But anyway, we survived. And, uh, he, he was watching and it was uh, it was actually a great day but he did did push he pushed for the for the limits on that um blah was a, a great guy in so many different ways and yes we've heard here and thank you thomas for mentioning his his footprint and fingerprints all over the cio you can see his little handwritten notes everywhere uh, he was quite uh, fastidious about things had to be done just the right way had little tolerance for people who were cutting corners or doing silly things what have you um, and wrote lots of manuals. And to that point, I should I should mention that um, when the Yahoo groups uh, shut down online, some of you who are geeksters knew about Yahoo groups, and that's what our organization was using as our online repository. You know how everyone saves everything to the cloud? You know, oh yeah, just send it to the cloud. It's safe, right? No, Yahoo groups send us notes saying, ah, oh, guess what? In a couple of months, we're shutting it down. You download it or it's gone, gonzo. Blake did. He downloaded all of that material, all of our archives, all of our photos, all of our messages, all of that material for the good of the club. And it took him who knows how long to, to organize and, and, and collect all that stuff. And he sent it on to another in the club for safety as well. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't find that file afterwards. And now what to do, right? So 
that was all of our archive, all the information, mostly about this place and all the manuals and all the, all the material. So we spoke with Donna and we said, Donna, Blake has to have that on his computer. He would not have just blown that away. So we gave her certain criteria, dates, you know, file size, whatever. And thank you very much, Donna. Donna gave me a zip drive today with all of those files on it. So Blake's still working for us today. <laughs> there we are. So, uh, yeah, um, there's a couple other things I just wanted to touch on anyway, but um, so many comments that people made today, it did, you know, twig a lot of memories. Um, it was very, very kind and generous. Um, he, he had kind of a um, almost familial uh, re relationship with us because uh, I guess he's considered kind of an, uh, an uncle to my three kids. And uh, just as, as you heard, I, I think it was... Uh, uh, I think I think it was Malcolm who was talking about getting the emails about your snow tires and what have you in that. He actually instructed my kids physically on how to uh, change your tires over, inspect the brakes. I see some more nodding heads. Oh, yeah, he's he was out there doing his thing. And uh, yes, we still have discussions in the car about, no, well, Blake says you adjust the mirrors this way. And, and you know, this is how you, you stay to the right. You don't just sit in the left lane and yada, yada. And I personally still think when I navigate a curve, like these S curves here on the gray road too, you want to respect, you know, the in the inward angle and the, where the apex of the curve is and your outbound angle. You still, still thinking of that. So he has definitely left a footprint uh, far and wide, uh, much farther than he would have imagined anyway, I'm sure. Um, I also want to touch on some of the things that I consider quite selfless of Blake. Uh, um, I knew that he was a, a blood donor for uh, Canadian Blood Services. And I saw a picture, which is circulated in some of the material we have here, but I knew that he was a longtime donor. And he had a certificate, a uh, picture with a standing with a certificate of 75 blood donations. So uh, he knew I was thinking about doing that. So when he lived in our hood in High Park, he said, oh, come on down, you know, you can, you can do it too, you know, whatever. So when he went to the, the local church, I would join in with him, you know. So he was, he roped me in, you know, I'm still doing it today. But, you know, we would have races. He would say, okay, let's see, who's going to finish fast enough? Six minutes, six, six minutes, you know, whatever. Like, so, yeah, so he would, we would actually get seated in the chair and get them to start at the same time. <laughs> so, yeah, what can I say? Weird, weird stuff. Um, Oh, sure. There's, there's Brianna. For me? So Blake oh. was quite important to me, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get through this. So just to dovetail you, you with start, what you're saying, you I was fortunate enough, to, fortunate enough to meet Blake back when I was still a child. I was technically in my angsty teen years, to be specific. It was a time that no one really seemed to understand except for Blake. Being a Nirvana fan, fan himself, he was quite familiar with angst. Blake quickly became a member of our extended family, and we enjoyed many evenings together at home, which he referred to as dinner as a, and a show, and here at the CAO as well. He was the only person I trusted with my dog when he was sick with cancer at the end of his life. Blake was always a sweetheart and just took time for everyone that he was with, as everybody here knows and can testify to. I'll miss Blake for my own sake now, because I can't just shoot him an email, never with more than one photo attachment without using a link as a shared file, otherwise you would get an earful. And I can't just casually ask him any of my inane questions about the universe without worrying that it would be embarrassing. <laughs> and I don't just mean questions about the cosmos, we would discuss existential crises we were having and the crucial difference between fantasy and sci-fi. I would ask Blake about all sorts of things, not least of which was cars, as everyone has mentioned today. Blake taught me how to change my brake pads, a skill that he felt every young driver should know, gender irregardless. And he taught me which part of the braking system was responsible for what. When I wanted to crumble in the face of U of T's computer science courses, he helped me to begin to learn Python, which seemed completely insurmountable to me, but Blake went through it very methodically and very patiently. To know Blake was to be privy to a wealth of knowledge. He uh, taught me a lot about winter driving as well. I never went to the track, but he tried to just share anecdotes about how to always be the boss of the road. And my first winter driving, I was picking up a friend down in southern Oakville, and little winter storm happens. This will be fine. Try to take a right turn. 
coasted right through the intersection. So my first reaction was maybe I should panic. I have no control here. And I just heard Blake come into my mind and I just took control, accelerated a bit instead of constantly braking. And I managed to swerve around all of the cars and just calmly go through. When we got through it, my friend said, she looked at my face and she said, you were completely calm. The other drivers were freaking out. I was freaking out and I don't know how you did it. And I don't know either, but Blake was with me. I have always admired his adventurous spirit and willingness to put himself out there to make meaningful connections with the world around him. And so now I miss him too for everyone who had not yet had the benefit of knowing Blake. But as it's been mentioned today, the truth is that Blake will never truly be gone. While I still hear his voice in my head telling me to be the boss of the road whenever I encounter any trouble while driving, or cursing at the stupid moon blech, when we're trying to observe, We'll never forget him while we still have his blog, Lumpy Darkness, to read and his plethora of YouTube videos to watch. Even those who hadn't met him yet continue to benefit from the work that he has done, both within Rask and beyond, everywhere that he goes. On our last visit in the palliative care ward, you were still teaching me, explaining calmly the function of each of your medical devices. When I held you close and told you that I loved you, you just kept telling me thank you, thank you, but thank you, Blake. When I left, the last thing you said to me was thank you for the show, but thank you for the entire ride. We'll see you around, Blake, in everything that we do. Thank you, thank you, Brianna. <clears throat> and I guess with that, we'll uh, wrap up this section. And what I'd ask for is maybe about a 15 or 20 minute break. Uh, we can uh, get a drink or, or stroll around and then we'll move to the rocket launch and we'll set up the rocket launch a little bit to that side here. And then we'll, we'll call everyone back in about 15 minutes or so. And the, Blake loved the rocket launches. The reason why is because when we, when we have our open house and awards picnics here at the car, uh, Blake always loved uh, the rocket launch portion and was part of the team that did the packing and the recovery of those. So uh, um, we thought this would be an excellent salute to um, launch some rockets in his honor today. I seriously thought of trying to get his ashes into space. Oh. <laughs> Marie said she tried, uh, she seriously thought about trying to get his ashes into space. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yes, that's right. The uh, Boeing uh, uh, Starliner. Yes. Uh, did it go actually, or is it still on hold? Still on hold. Still on, still on hold. Okay, so yes, so that is significant. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So we mentioned that uh, today is the same day for the the first launch of the manned uh, Boeing vehicle. Anyway, um, there is there's actually two other things I should pass along that some people have asked about. Um, some people have asked or mentioned that they'd like to see something named for Blake in his honor. And there was a suggestion that perhaps the double star program that he was working on at the at the national level uh, could be named for him. I've I've learned by speaking with people at the national level and the chair of the National Observing Committee that Blake was absolutely opposed to such a move. Um, that in fact he believed that these programs. Uh, are, should not be recognizing a person who organized a program because those people aren't the actual uh, discoverer of those objects. They're they're not actually related to the the objects themselves. And I believe at National there has been an effort to systematically uh, remove naming of of programs based on someone who helped assemble it. So he's absolutely thrilled, I'm sure, that the program uh, was completed largely with his care. But uh, I think he would be disappointed if we went uh, against his uh, wishes to do that. Now, that being said, um, there has been some discussion on committee here in the CAO and some discussion about members at large about perhaps installing a, a fixture here at the CAO that would honor him, perhaps a sundial or a bench or some other object. And that's something we'd be very happy to pursue. So if you'd like to consider that or think about that. We can, that's something. That's something the council will look at. The awards committee, Ralph Chu here is the is the chair of our awards committee. 
So certainly if you're interested in that, speak with Ralph on that. Um, so we could do that. But so there are lots of options, but the, uh, the, the, the double star program is not going to be one of them. And so I just wanted to pass that along. So in case people were, were considering that, um, I think that's about all we need to say for now. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, uh, so grateful for everyone who had the courage to come out and speak. Great. Thank you. So 15 minutes or so folks.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll be starting the rocket launches in a couple of minutes, so if you'd please reassemble uh, and move your chairs maybe move your chairs maybe uh, closer to the uh, main event. All right, if we could have everyone's attention and we're just about ready to start the rockets and Malcolm here is our unfortunate contestant who gets to launch the first one. So if it blows up, it's not my fault. Okay. Anyway, so if you direct your attention to the tripod out in the field, here we, go, we have Andrew. out by modal number five, we have a staff with a ribbon that shows a wind direction, which has been very variable today. So we're, we're crossing our fingers that it does not land in the pond, which is over there with the red and white sign. Or the cars. Or the cars. Okay, just everyone be warned. We can't control where they come down. It might come down on your head or on your sunroof. So anyway, it's coming down somewhere. Um, just very briefly, people ask how these rockets work. They are electrically fired. There is a uh, cartridge inside each one, which is renewable, that has a propellant that burns for a certain number of seconds and then there is a delay, and then there is an ejection charge where we'll pop off the nose cone and deploy the chute. Hopefully everything works well, the vehicle doesn't separate, yada yada. Malcolm, when... nice guy. <laughs> All right, let's go. All right, so are we ready to give Malcolm a big countdown starting from five? Ready? Five, four, three, Out of the camera, please. One. Blast off! Blast off! And no. Blast off! <laughs> okay, hold on. Okay, so we're going to have to check that one. This, that's why we have a test rocket at the beginning. Well, we'll check that. We'll just be right back to you. Hold on. Okay, so let's see. We seem to have had a crossed igniter on there, so we're going to try that again. So, Malcolm, if you're ready, put in the safety key. And... Five, four, three, two, one. And it's coming right back to the stage. That's not bad. Pretty good. So that is our test shot. And we've proved the system is good and the aiming is reasonable. Thomas doesn't have to go to the pond. Very good. All right, just a moment then. Thank you, Malcolm. A lot of pomp and ceremony here. And, all right. Ceremony. Very good. And now we're going to flip the toggle switch up on the left to the top. And you should have a red indicator. Yes, I see that. All right. So we should be good for launch. We're going to give the count. Five, four, three, two, one. Blast off. Uh oh. Uh oh. That one's going way down range. <laughs> well, Thomas, I think you've got a little bit of a hike. So if our binocular spotters can keep an eye fixed on that point. <laughs> okay, so clearly, clearly that was a heavier vehicle and we were overcompensating for the wind. So we'll have to deal with that now with the next shot coming right up. And just place that into the... Plug at the top left, Insert top right. Key. Yes, that's right. Key is inserted. And flip the toggle switch up. Toggle switch up. And you have the red light. I have the red light. So we are good for five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Last off. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> oh, that was a high one. That's wow. a nice one. That that's actually, <laughs> that came from Charles, actually. Thank you, Charles. Uh, that one looks like it's heading for the parking lot. <laughs> Malcolm, open the hatch. We need someone on the other side of the house. Someone quickly run to the other side of the parking lot. Thanks, Jeff. We're counting on you. Oh, it missed the tree. Oh, the driveway. Getting there. So we have one more, and I believe this is going to be Donna and Rhonda are going to fire this guy. Now, this is a behemoth. This is the mean machine. It stands, I believe, 79 inches tall. Let's see what happens. Oh. 
Hmm? Yeah. My uh, my late stepson used to like. I was just gonna say that. I guess I can't do it. Hmm. His uh his launch pad wasn't as near as nearly as nice as that one. You know, I could be here for you, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was really quite startling, wasn't it? It was. It was. Okay, so we had a little bit of corrosion on the uh, launch rod there, but I think we're good for launch. We still have that variable wind from the southwest. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to adjust the trajectory, just a moment. Aim for the guy in the white shirt. Well, this is going to go higher, right? So it's going to travel here. Right over. Yeah, yeah. Well, we would like to lose it on its first maiden launch, right? All right, so we're ready, ladies. So we want to insert the key. On the top there, uh, in, there we are. And we have a red light, I see. So let's go for the count. Five, four, three, two, one. Blast off. Beautiful launch. All right. Oh, that's the one that's going to do it. That's Come the money on. shot. Yeah. Okay, who's going to catch it? We, we actually have had kids catch them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's a good idea. Send out the young ones. You can replace them. <laughs> Watch out for those fins. They're sharp. <laughs> good job. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. That concludes our uh, rocket program for today. Uh, so a little bit of free time. The barbecue has been lit. And uh, soon it'll be time for socializing and uh, din din. Yum yum. Make sure you grab some drinks and uh, enjoy. Thanks very much.